Well, as, as Peter said, welcome to all of you and thanks for uh, showing up for this talk. Uh, we're excited to have David Schmetterling, uh, who is a fisheries research coordinator for Montana Fish FWP. He's an expert on sculpin, which are little fish that you probably don't see very much. And uh, however, today he's going to be wearing his other hat uh, as uh, a wildlife gardener or birdscaper. And uh, this, I think, is more, uh, is more a passion than a career, but he has made a mark in Missoula and uh, around uh, the state of Montana in this way. And he and his wife, who is uh, also a scientist, uh, but a botanist, have created a natural landscape on their uh, city lot in the city of Missoula. And after a lot of you know, research and I think experimentation probably on that lot. Uh, they have uh, attracted insects for um, food and pollination uh, and then uh, attracted a huge number of birds for a small urban lot um, by providing the insects, the uh, shelter and nest sites. And um, uh, I think he's going to explain to us how this, how he was able to make this happen and how we can uh, help um, help our native birds and insects and other animals by creating uh, natural landscapes with native plants on our own uh, properties. And especially in a time where habitat loss is, is huge and uh, climate change is going to make things worse, this kind of um, uh, work is uh, crucial to keeping uh, animals of all sorts and birds especially alive and uh, thriving. And with no mo more wasted time, I'm going to let uh, David take over and tell us about uh, conservation gardening, uh, meaningful landscaping in your own yard. Go ahead, Dave. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, that was a great introduction. I mean, he gave away 90% of my talk here. I mean, <laughs> the, the gist is provide habitat and you are going to um, see some, you know, really exciting and fun results in your backyard. Um, but thank you, you know, very much for uh, inviting me to speak. I've, I've never talked to this group before and it's always neat to see different groups um, around the state, um, you know, and, and see people's interests, especially on such an important topic, you know, like climate change. And you know, sometimes it seems like the issues with climate change or water or resource conservation are so complex, um, so like far reaching, vast, out of our control. It's, it seems like it's, it's hopeless a lot of the time to make a difference. But what I'm going to talk about tonight are a few things that you can do in your own backyard that can have a meaningful effect on conservation of resources and on wildlife. And, you know, if you get nothing else from my talk, you know, I, I just hope people, you know, think of gardening for wildlife as something that's accessible to everybody. Um, and it's easy and fun more than anything. Um, I know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also an avid vegetable gardener and I have a lot of friends that are, that are gardeners and, you know, everyone has different goals, which we'll, we'll talk about. And I've got some friends that have like goals of you know, for incorporating struggle into their lives in terms of like growing the most difficult, complicated plants or find, you know, growing something that lodged in their eye once and they want to provide a home for it or whatever. Uh, I take a very different approach and, uh, and I'll talk about that, but it all, it, it, no matter what you do gardening wise, it all just depends on goals. And I'll share, you know, our goals and I hope people take the opportunity to even jot down maybe some of their, their own goals to this stuff. Um, yeah, so th thanks again. And uh, um, yeah, Kit did a great job of uh, introducing some of, some of the concepts I'm gonna talk tonight. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, I hope all goes well. And I know a few people just joined. So if people have questions, um, answer or ask them in the chat. And then at the end of the talk, or if it's, you know, if it's really timely or something like that, maybe Peter will, will monitor it to, to, to let me know if I kind of don't explain something or my screen goes blank or, or something like that. Um, you can let me know about, about that. Um, I'll share my screen. 
get started. So um, when, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but for a long time, I actually had a, uh, a blog called Montana Wildlife Gardener. Um, and it's still up. It's still a resource uh, for people to use online. I just don't maintain it anymore. And it still gets a fair amount of, of views. It just seemed like, um, and the, 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 the topics that I was um, discussing were just kind of getting repeated over time. And I thought, you know, this is probably good. I'm just going to leave it here for, for other, other folks. Um, so, Apropos to this group, and anytime I, you know, I give a talk that's related to climate change, I think it's important, um, you know, to mention that, you know, climate change is real. It's because of people. It's bad. There's consensus among scientists. Scientists agree. But, you know, apropos to this talk, there's something we can do about it, even at a very small scale. And even though it's bad, and we're doing it, we can be the ones to to help solve it. So now literally going to your own backyard, what can you do? And that's where I'm gonna to talk tonight. I'm gonna to talk first about the context for the home garden and why use natives, and then explore wildlife gardening in terms of providing habitat by using native plants. Talk about wildlife that you can attract and have success with. And then finally, I'm gonna kind of end with some plant recommendations. Um, um, because that, that always seems to be what people want to know, you know, so I'll, I'll get there at, at the end. <laughs> so like I mentioned, I, I've, I've had a blog for a long time. Um, it's discontinued, but it's called Montana Wildlife Partner. I'm sure it's easy to find. And there's a lot of how-to things um, or, um, or just descriptions of what's going on you know, in my garden at that, that point in time. Uh, it's a good resource for a lot of different, different things. And what I'm going to be talking about tonight um, is frankly just my my own garden, my home garden. And the reason why I like to talk about that and share slides of that is because um, I think it's accessible for a lot of people. You know, we live in a small city lot right in the middle of Missoula. Um, there it is. <laughs> it's a it's a maybe a tenth of an acre. I think it's 0.09 acres, but we'll round it up to a tenth, probably. Yeah. And um, it's much like, you know, what we have is similar to what everybody else has all around us. And you know, we're not surrounded by, you know, adjacent to natural areas, rivers, um, you know, any, anything else. We just live right in the middle of town. So it was a really unique opportunity um, to try to attract wildlife and to garden for wildlife. Like I mentioned, everybody has a different garden and everyone's garden, everyone's goals are different. Um, and these are our, our landscape goals, mine and my wife's. Our, our goals were to use Missoula area native plants exclusively in our landscaping. Um, so it's not just Montana native plants, but just ones that are native to the Missoula area, the Missoula Valley. The only water we wanted to use in our garden was just for plants that were just for things we eat, our vegetables. Um, we wanted to create wildlife habitat, but also expand our living space. We didn't just want to create a place for insects and birds, but a place that we could use and we can we could share. And then this, this you know, this last goal here, what is is probably a lot different than others, but another one of our goal was to the goals were to educate others and serve as a demonstration of what you could do in a small city lot and what Missoula area plants look like. Um, and this is all, you know, in the middle of town. So this is the kind of wildlife that we have. We, since we live, you know, literally in the middle of Missoula, we don't even have uh, deer or rare occurrences. Um, you know, all around town, you know, there's a lot of deer, but um, birds, insects, um, and small mammals, those are the sorts of wildlife that we were expecting to realistically attract. We do get deer, you know, walking through every so often, but, um, but not, not We wanted to have a lot of flowers, and it sounds really simple and really basic, but um, 
I, I, I remember one point looking out, standing on the back steps with my wife and saying like, I wish, wish we could just look out here and see flowers, you know, pretty simple. We wanted places to do, you know, perform our, our hobbies, our interests, our vegetable garden. Um, you know, we have a greenhouse, a vegetable garden, um, all integrated into this, into this landscape. Uh, chicken coop. Um, the, the, that's our dog. Those are the chickens. They, they frighten him. Um, we, you know, needed place for other activities like, you know, off-season storage of our, of our camper. Um, but again, you know, integrating all these, I think, all these things into our garden. Um, and we didn't want to have a garden that was only, you know, it's, it's easy, you know, like uh, in, in the spring or early July, everything's green, lush, and uh, in flower. You don't water anything. Um, you know, we get to see the transition over time and the colors of, of fall. Um, and even have interest in the wintertime. And that's what the landscaping and the structures in the garden provide. And that last part I mentioned about, you know, education, uh, we have, unlike most people, we have interpretive signs in our front yard, um, which is the most public space in, in our house or like anybody's um, homes, you know, the, um, and as a result, we use that space differently. You know, the, the front yard um, is, you know, is, 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 open, is, you know, visible from the sidewalk. The boulevard is actually, you know, owned by the city that we've landscaped. So these are people, you know, stopping by, reading signs, seeing what's flowering um, and what can be, what can be done. And, and also to, to kind of explain to people what, what's going on here, because our yard does look quite a bit different than the, the conventional lawn on either side of us. So to back up a little bit, I mean, I think one place to start is to think about, you know, what is the home garden? Um, you know, what it's become for a lot of people is synonymous with work. You know, maintaining something that they don't necessarily want, they don't necessarily use, but, um, you know, but, but they feel an obligation to, to do it a certain way. But what I want to mention is that your garden is important. You know, it's, um, and it can be much more than just the collection of ornamental plants that come from some part, uh, some other part of the world. And this important, um, and some of these wildlife interactions and things you can attract are really spectacular. You know, this is a viceroy um, butterfly. You know, it's a, a monarch mimic, for example. Um, and you can you can attract those, and you can also attract monarchs. You know, monarchs are kind of a novelty in Missoula. Um, they it's too far east of the um, you know coastal flyways, too far west of the central flyways. Being in the mountains, they do come through here, but they're really not um, you know a, um, a very important species in the Missoula area. But it's neat that you know by providing habitat in terms of milkweed, you can you can attract them sometimes. So in terms of the, you know, the context of the home garden, you know, homes, this is, this is why your home is important. If you think of all the houses and, and lots in, uh, in the country um, together collectively, it's really an ecosystem. And that's how people are starting to recognize these things. They're not separate from the natural world. They're just a, just a different portion of, of the world. You know, animals, insects, you know, everything, they don't recognize some of these barriers, you know, these you know, social barriers we have, um, and they still try to use these areas, but, but they get shunned. Um, you know, historically, you know, our landscaping was influenced by French and English um, designs for gardens that were not um, designed to be maintained by a homeowner and not appropriate for the climate. Um, and then for, for generations, landscapers have used a really limited palette of plants and applied it all over the country. So, you know, not only do they represent other climates, but whether you're in, in Maryland or Utah or California or Colorado, people are just using, you know, five or seven species, whether it's Kentucky bluegrass, arborvitae, 
um, you know, et cetera. They just get repeated. And it's not just that it's an aesthetic issue, which, which bothers me, but um, it's an ecological problem because we're now, not only do homeowners have this large collective area, we're now making it inaccessible and unpalatable for animals that are trying to use it, as well as for, um, for people too. It's, um, you know, again, going at the idea of people creating work for themselves, but also we have such a regionally distinct and unique country. Um, you know, the flora and fauna of this country are, are magnificent. And it's, it's really sad in some ways to see, you know, this whole homogenization, even at, uh, you know, a landscape scale. Um, so another way to look at this is collectively because homeowners represent, you know, uh, you know an ecosystem or a, a large area. Homeowners are really essential or a key part of conservation or can be a key part of conservation. And I hope that this, you know, is empowering that you are, you can be part um, of a solution when we talk about global declines of insects or global declines of birds. Think about that collective ecosystem of homes so you can be part of the solution. So why use natives? Why well, I, I talked about it a little bit already, and this is kind of the, uh, this kind of gets at the, the whole answer to my talk, but for a lot of reasons. One, a sense of place. Um, and this is what I, what I was getting at, about, getting about the regional distinctiveness being lost. I mean, um, you know, the, just simply the colors of, you know, the grasses and the hillsides in fall. You know, it, it, it's such a stark contrast in Missoula a lot of times where you'll see, you know, the Mount Sentinel, the mountain with the M on it, you know, and it's that beautiful shade of amber, you know, and then, you know, but you're standing on some green iridescent lawn, you know, looking at it, it just it doesn't really give you a sense of time and certainly not place. Um, suitability to environment or resource intensiveness, you know, obviously native plants don't rely on any additional inputs of, of nutrients. Um, and then they are suitable to whatever environment they're in. They're never invasive. And this is a huge issue, um, especially with, um, you know, with, with, with the changing climate and, uh, and the movement of people and other things. But native plants, by their nature, can never be invasive. And there's also a big issue with gardeners because um, a lot of the invasive plants we have in this country are, um, are unintentional from garden, you know, the spread of, by gardeners and release by gardeners who are from gardens. There is an A to plan for every situation, um, but the main thing and the main reason to use wildlife or wildlife, use natives, in my opinion, is for wildlife. Um, and again, the type of wildlife I'm going to be talking about are primarily insects and, and birds in this case. So the steps for a wildlife, a successful wildlife garden, native plants. And that's it. That's all I've got for my talk tonight. Um, so we're good if we can, no, I'm just kidding. But that is true. That's just as simple as it is. And that's really all, all you need. But there's more. And I'll give you some of the conventional answer, answers here as well. Uh, diversity of plants. That's um, incredibly important. And that's another thing I want uh, to impress upon people. Um, and the other thing that's you know, also really important is, is less lawn. I'll get to that. Um, but structure, food, water, shelter, places to raise young, all those conventional things that you've probably heard about, oops, sorry, that wildlife need. Um, one of the most popular posts on my blog and the way most people um, around the country for a long time found my blog was from doing a, a search uh, um, with the words how to remove lawn. And for a long time, um, it was, um, uh, um, the most, uh, I had kind of battled with the LA Times or something like that for the top Google results for those, those search words, but uh, it's still the, the most, probably the most popular post. Um, and th that's great. I'm very excited that that's still really popular because anything you can do to, to lessen your lawn is one of the most sustainable things you can do and the most beneficial for wildlife. I like to use the example, if you were just to, um, this is gonna, uh, no, uh, maybe I won't, okay, I'll, I'll use it anyway. If you were to tear up your, if you were to remove your lawn completely, get it down to bare soil and plant 
knapweed. It would be better for wildlife than your lawn, okay? That's an extreme example. I do not want anybody to plant knapweed. But the point is, what um, your lawn is probably one of the worst things for, for wildlife because of its, it, yeah, because of, for, for a variety of reasons. You've probably seen these statistics. These are actually pretty old. I, I could probably update them. But um, shockingly, the American law, the lawn is the number one irrigated crop in the United States. Um, it covers over 40 million acres. It's more than corn, um, more than wheat. You know, and if you think about it, it's probably one of the most despised. You know, people refer to their lawn, like I mentioned before, as work, um, a task, you know, something that's, that's burdensome. Um, in, you know, more locally, um, I can't remember if this is Montana or Missoula specifically, but people spend about, you know, 240 gallons of water per person per day on their lawns. And, you know, in this country, or, you know, that water has been, um, it is, you know, especially if you live in a city or municipality, it's been uh, pumped, treated, delivered as drinking water, and then it's put on people's lawns. Um, outdoor watering for landscaping is over a half of municipal water use, and that's all drinking water that, that, that people put on their um, typically ornamental gardens. And then you get into pesticides and gasoline with lawns, and it's a tremendous problem. So what I like to, I'm not saying everyone should get rid of all their lawn, but if you think about the space that you devote to a lawn, if you didn't have that, or if you were to lessen it, even by a third, what could you have? Um, and like I showed you, you know, what, what we have is, when we, when we moved into this house, it was just a lawn except for this garage. Everything here and everything else that you've seen um, are things that we've planted over time. Or we could just, you know, have, have a lawn there. And everybody's goals are different. But if your interest is in wildlife and attracting wildlife to your yard, um, you need native plants. Um, and just simply by using native plants in your landscape, you can make a difference. You can benefit wildlife. You can improve the situation for, for insects. And I like to call it native plant gardening because it encompasses everything. Um, you know, a lot of people want to attract hummingbirds to their garden, and by God, who doesn't? I mean, hummingbirds are little miracles of the bird world. They're, they're, they're wonderful. Um, yeah. They're really neat. People like to have pollinators, you know, of course, I'll talk a lot about those. They want to attract birds. They want to be water wise. They want to be sustainable, climate smart, whatever you want to put in here. And the way to really achieve those successfully is just to use native plants. So in, in our yard, you know, we tried to limit it more just to plants that are native to the Missoula area, but it's really not limiting at all. Um, by using what I call the right plant in the right place, like understanding the plant's needs and understanding kind of, um, you know, some of those conditions that exist in your yard, you know, in, in terms of like shade from your house or, or things like that, you can actually get even more of a diversity than would have been here when Missoula was, was, a, was a prairie. But there's, you know, we have over 100 species of Missoula area native plants in our, in our yard. Um, probably the most diverse cities in our front yard where we have over 70 species of plants. Um, despite the fact that we're avid gardeners, you know, we use less than a third um, of the water as an average home in Missoula. Um, so in terms of water conservation, it's really, really significant. Um, you know, I, I like to use the example of, I, you know, I, I strongly think people should use um, low flow shower heads or faucets or things like that, but you can get rid of two thirds of your water use by, by using native plants or being you know, really thoughtful with what, what you use water for. Um, so all those, everything matters, um, but this is a big deal. So to talk about the diversity really briefly, um, several years ago, I, um, you know, I, I told people, I would tell people, yeah, we have, you know, starting in March and going through September, 
we have like you know something flowering every day, something you know new flowering every every day for most of the year. So um, just to Im impress that, or just to discuss that point a little more, or demonstrate it. Several years ago, I started um, just documenting every day what way on new species that was flowering in our in our garden. Um, and this was just, you know, 90 days here or 80, 80 or 90 days here. Um, this are, is all on, on Instagram. But one thing you notice is there's, a, there's a, a wide variety of colors, shapes, textures, and everything um, with, with, with plants. Um, and, uh, and then you also have to consider, you know, sizes and the duration or timing at which they flower. So what you see is just a tremendous amount, or hopefully you see here, is it's just a tremendous amount of diversity. And that diversity is really, really important for wildlife. Um, people are probably, you know, probably, probably really aware now about the diversity of bees we have, for example. This is one example. Um, in North America, our, our bee diversity is incredible. Um, and in Montana, our diverse, the diversity we have of bumblebees is incredible too. We have, like Montana has some of the greatest diversity of bumblebees. Um, yet unfortunately, most people think of, um, you know, describing you know, all of our, our native bees and diverse bees and bumblebees is either like, you know, you know, bees or wasps, um, you know, some, a lot of that being negative. Um, but we, we, yeah, we have this incredible diversity of, of these, the, these pollinators, um, and that's because of the diversity of plants we have. It seemed like at some point with the uh, um, colony collapse disorder, you know, people got um, really interested and, and concerned about uh, bees, but it got conflated with honeybees. And uh, I wrote a provocative piece for Garden Rant. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, that blog. <laughs> it's a joke, but, or it's true, but also a joke. Uh, where I declared that honeybees suck. And this was uh, you know, 10 years ago because it, it felt like it was really drawing the attention away from the plight and the interest and the fascination people have with our native bees and the diversity there. Um, and, and while the honeybee, you know, colony collapse disorder, you know, was, is, it was a, an issue, um, it wasn't a conservation issue. And that's where, where things got kind of confused. And there's a lot of, um, yeah. I'll leave it at that. But honeybees can't do very much and they can't do it all the time. They're you know, specifically bred to pollinate um, monocultures um, and also over a, a, a small range of temperatures and a small range of sizes of flowers. So they're not very effective pollinators, especially for the plants we have around here. You know, starting in March when you have sagebrush buttercups coming up, you know, the temperatures are too cold, say, for honeybees to so to function well, and that's where our native bees come in and that diversity. And speaking of diversity, you know, when, once you start looking at the size and timing of these flowers, like um, blue-eyed Mary here, you know, a honeybee, for example, is not gonna do anything with that. Or shooting stars, just because of the, the structure of these flowers, they need very special pollinators. And that's what the diversity of, of, of our pollinators has adapted to. Or like showy milkweed, like I showed you before with the monarch on it, uh, their floral structure is really unique that it only allows for pollination by some of our really charismatic mega butterflies, you know. Um, um, and yeah, just the size and the shape is so unique and so diverse. Um, and these are all not only, you know, miscellaneous native plants, these are also, you know, in our, in our garden. They, they, they thrive at different times grow at different heights, um, different colors, different shapes. So you need diversity. And um, this is our, our front yard, which is more of just a, um, a kind of a, a more wild prairie um, as a demonstration. But this is what diversity looks like. Um, habitat and diversity it also takes you know, other, other uh, shapes. For example, snags, um, you know, dead wood, that's something that is really common um, you know, out in the forests and riparian areas, but it's the, one of the quickest things to get removed from any kind of landscape. And yet this provides an incredible habitat for a variety of species, which I'll talk about later. One of the most important things, and this kind of goes back to my knapweed example, is just bare ground, you know, having access to the soil. 
most of our native bees um, are solitary nesting and they nest in the ground. Some are colony nesting and they nest in the ground, um, but most are ground nesters. And what you see here is actually a bumblebee burrow um, in our yard, and these are rosy pussy toes um, surrounding it. So having that connection to the soil is so important for, you know, in, in the examples I've been giving here with bees is you know, with our, our native ground nesting bees. Um, other bees, for example, uh, like the, the, so this is a rose here and you can see all these cutouts. This isn't herbivory, they're not eating it, but they're using, they're cutting out um, the, these little uh, sections to line their, their solitary nests, um, megachylidae um, bees. So success, uh, which I'll talk about, it just, I think the easiest way is just having a variety of native plants, okay? And the key is to focus on habitat and not make um, connections between one species and another because the interactions are really complicated and very hard to predict. So I'll talk about this a little more, but we you know, we know like, I think the monarch is a great example and I think it's really taught us about those, you know, um, you know intimate connections, you know, the monarch caterpillars can only eat milkweed, right? Um, but there's, you know, even though, like I mentioned, monarch aren't common in the Missoula area, it isn't really a, a realistic goal for, 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 for gardening. All the other insects have those unique and close relationships with a native plant. And that's why diversity is so important. So just to give you an idea of like what kind of interactions you can have in your backyard and how some of these interactions are complicated, I'm just gonna talk about this, you know, literally one corner of our yard and this little aspen grove in our yard and, and what it provides and probably just a really small portion of what it provides. So this picture was taken maybe um, almost 20 years ago, probably maybe a little less than that. It planted a little grove of aspen in the corner of our yard where it's really shady. It's shaded by our house and it's shaded by our neighbor's house because we're the houses are close together. And shade is a really good surrogate for water. Um, and so we planted plants here that were more shade tolerant or, or more water loving, like aspen, Rocky Mountain iris, um, smooth blue aspen, and, and some showy flea vein and things, things that, that, that do well in the shade, uh, Canada violets in there too. And, you know, I thought, okay, well, this is, this is just adorable. You know, is this going to be the, you know, the end point or what? Um, so aspen are native to the Missoula Valley, um, but they really just, you know, exist on the outskirts of it, the periphery, because the Missoula Valley was obviously a, a prairie and, uh, and, all Aspen, um, kind of like you know, Missoula residents are a little stressed there. Right? Um, it's 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 just a little bit too warm, too dry, and that stress is important. And this is this is why they don't really penetrate very far into the into the valley. Um, so the this is how I like to think of the cycle starting. So this is a bald-faced hornet. Um, it, you know, bald-faced hornets get a really bad rap, um, and it's always because they're, they're not aggressive. Um, but it's always because somebody, you, the story usually starts with, well, I was pulling their house down and they attacked me, you know, for, for no reason, but I was pulling their house down, you know. Um, but they, you know, they, they live like right next to people all the time. And it's always just in the fall when you realize, oh my goodness, there's this basketball sized nest that's been next to my house. How did I not notice this thing? But, um, you know, bald taste horns are really neat. Um, they're, they you know, um, yeah, they've got really strong mandibles and stuff. And when they build their nests in the spring, they, uh, they can chew through the bark of aspen. Everything eats aspen, um, including these guys, but they're not actually eating it. They mix it with saliva and, and make those gigantic basketball sized nests. But because their, their mandibles are so strong, they can easily break through this bark. So you can see in a few of these places where they've, where they've done that. So that sets the whole stage up for the aspen. So right now, you can basically say this aspen is, is dead because what comes next? could be the aspen borer beetle. Okay, and I, I'm glad that, I hope there's no children here, but um, I should have warned people about, about this. Um, but this is what these do in the spring. Um, and so these are really big beetles. I don't know how many people have seen them, but one thing you can tell is they're really, you know, um, camouflaged incredibly well for the bark of aspens. And that's good because uh, camouflage is their 
friends. They're, they fly like, um, kind of like you would imagine a sheet of plywood flying through the air. They're not very swift. They're, they're not very nimble, um, but their camouflage, I think, uh, carries them through pretty well. And you look how big this thing is. I mean, that's like my wife is like five and a half feet back there. Just a forced perspective. They're not that, that, that big, but they're really big. And they also have these big mandibles. So this is a, this is a female and she's actually laying her eggs um, into the bark. But, but this is where the bald-faced hornet comes in. Um, they'll actually, you know, use places that have already been scarred by like a bald-faced hornet. So they get a head start at breaking through that, that bark. Once the um, eggs are laid, she'll lay a protective or cover it, cover it, encase those eggs with a protective coating um, and to keep them safe. And this is what they try to keep them safe from, um, everything else in the world. So once the eggs hatch, the larvae um, will try to burrow deep into the, into the bark where they'll stay for several years. But once they hatch, they attract a lot of attention. In this case, um, thatching ants, um, you know, one of the forgotten pollinators. Ants uh, you know, do a lot of work for pollination. Typically any kind of low growing or white colored flower is probably ant pollinated. But these thatching ants, what they're doing here is trying to pull out the larvae before they have a chance to burrow into safety. And this will also attract the attention of bald-faced hornets once again. Um, and they do a great job of pulling out a lot of those, those larvae. Um, and that's what the, uh, I'm sure the aspen are, are happy about that. But inevitably, um, some of those larvae survive and they bore through the aspen and, and ultimately kill it. That's the MO. But that's the thing with aspen is all you're looking at here is just a stem of an aspen. You know, they're, they're communities. They're not just supposed to be a specimen tree. So one of the things that gets triggered by all this is more rooting and more shoots from the aspen too, because it, it knows that that stem is going to be dead. It might take six to 30 years, but that stem will die. Another defensive thing the aspen does is it forces out sap to help flush it and, and, uh, or, or kill those larvae. Well, that sap is one of the most important sources of food for a variety of insects, especially in the spring. Um, so this is, this is actually an early spring picture. And um, the, one, the things that get attracted to that sap are overwintering butter, or butterflies that overwinter as adults. Um, you know, we have a lot of, um, uh, if, if people um, have noticed, like in the springtime, you'll have like that first sunny day and you'll see butterflies flying around. And if you've ever done the math, you're thinking, well, how could that thing go from an egg to a caterpillar to a butterfly because we've only had like one day above freezing? Well, a lot of times it's because they've overwintered as adults um, and, uh, you know, in brush piles and things like that. Um, and, you know, when they come out of their hibernacula, um, there's no flowers around for them to feed on or anything like that. And it's, it's sources like this um, sap that are gonna be really important. So going back to the whole idea of like, don't plant a single species for a single animal. It's again, thinking about these interactions. I think sap is one of the best, um, you know, most important things in a pollinator garden. But to try to explain somebody like how to go about getting that sap for the butterflies is gonna take a little, little bit of time, you know, rather than just plant plants, and let things happen. Don't spray the insects, right? So this is what those borers look like. And this is when, after they're a few years old and they're actually getting ready to emerge, and when that happens, they get really close to the surface of the bark. This whole time, they've been deep inside the aspen and they're really not susceptible to any predation. But once they, get, they start boring closer to the surface, um, just out of curiosity, I actually uh, peeled back the bark here to see if I could find some. Um, because I knew they were close to the surface because we had hairy woodpeckers coming and excavating them, them out. And the timing of this is really critical. Um, when they get close to the surface and when hairy woodpeckers, for example, will start to feed on them because that's the time when their hairy woodpeckers are raising their young. And that's a big meal for a woodpecker. So all that boring, um, or, you know, uh, all, all the boring that the borers do in, in, the, in the wood leaves a duff around those aspen trees. And that provides um, great um, uh, 
area for um, for larvae or to, for like chrysalises or pupa to um, to mature, including those of like a clear wing moth. This is a, a yellow jacket mimic. This is a moth with clear wings, or even the um, sphinx moth, five line or white uh, five line sphinx moth larvae. That's where they'll pupate is under that gum. So all of these insects, just in this little corner of the yard, um, are relying on just that one species, the aspen. So if you just think of that happening in a place that's really visible, and I, you know, just as an example, if you have 20 species, you know, if you can think about the possibilities there um, with, with what's going on. So native plants are better for insects than non-native plants, again, because of the long evolutionary history they have. But they support really diverse life stages. For example, egg-laying females and their larvae. That's the important thing. It's not necessarily what adults do. Um, adults will feed on a variety of things, but the native plants provide for the larvae. If you don't have the larvae, you don't have the adults. Um, so people talk about plants that are similar to native plants and how they're better in many cases. Um, but it's not equal and it's certainly not, not better. Um, so you'll, especially now, when people, it seems, I don't know if this is more than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but there's a kind of a new resurgence in people, you know, thinking about drought tolerant plants, right? Um, well, certainly, you know, plants that are native here are tolerant to our conditions, so that's where you should go. But you'll you'll hear things like Russian sage or or some other ones that escape me right now as being, you know, really um, they can survive in our climate. They're drought tolerant and they're great for um, insects and they're insect and disease resistant. But you can't have it both ways. Um, Meaning, um, if a larvae, you know, if, if, if an insect larvae isn't eating it, um, it's, it's not necessarily good. And the way to think about it is people really like birds. Birds eat insects. That's predominantly what they eat. They do come to feeders. There are certain species that will eat seeds and things like that. Most of the time, most of the places, birds eat insects. Insects eat plants. And that's, so if you want birds, you need the plants. Um, I, you know, I talked about the monarch example that people um, know really well. And I think that's one of the benefits of monarchs is, is, is explaining them and articulating that. Um, you know, if everybody wants butterflies, well, to have that, you need to have the larval host plant. Um, I should have warned you, this is uh, about to show pictures of herbivory. So for gardeners, you know, I hope everybody's sitting down to brace yourself. But some of the, you know, so all of these things that I'm showing you now are plant or insects that eat plants. And just keep in mind that, you know, they typically eat specific plants. Um, so you need to have a diversity of them. And then you can have a real diversity of insects. And some of these are, you know, incredibly beautiful, like the cal cal calligrapha beetles, for example. Um, you know, and it's really amazing what you can have happen in your backyard when you just provide some, some habitat for them. Aphids, right? The, uh, you know, the, the nuisance of every vegetable gardener, um, but there's a lot of different species of aphids. And the aphids that are on your tomato plants aren't the same aphids that are on your, your goldenrod. And if you look, um, so this, uh, this is gorgeous. I just love everything that's going on in this picture. So this is a, a goldenrod plant. There's a pen stuff in the background. And then look how many aphids are on this thing. But the plant is thriving, and this is a source of food for, um, for a lot of different animals. Um, you know, whether they're birds that are hunting the aphids or they're ants that are tending the aphids and getting their honeydew. There's a lot going on here. And, uh, and again, just to be clear, these aphids aren't gonna eat your eggplants and the, egg, and the aphids on your eggplants aren't gonna eat your, your native plants. And there's also insects that eat you know, fruits like these shield bugs and the early instars or your grasshoppers. Um, they're all out there. 
Um, like Kit mentioned, you know, we've had a lot of birds use our, our yard, and uh, that was one of our goals. And over the years, you know, of, uh, of um, you know, documented all the birds that, that use the yard. And um, and when I say, you know, we've had seven, so we've had seven, over 70 species of birds use, the, use our yard. Um, it doesn't include like, you know, bald eagles flying overhead or, a, you know, great blue heron going to the yard doing something. And most of the things that they're doing are hunting uh, for insects and eating insects. And then annually we get red-breasted nuthatches, black-capped chickadees, and flickers nesting in the garden as well. Sometimes house wrens too. Um, yeah, and that's that's been really gratifying. But the way we've done it again is 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 by providing them habitat. And by habitat, I just mean a lot of different plants. One thing we don't use are conventional bird feeders. Um, and especially in you know the Missoula area, I think it's or a or, or anywhere, it, I think it's you know in bear country, it's, it's really a big consideration in a, in a big issue, not just for bears but for you know, for other wildlife, creating predator traps, um, spreading diseases. I mean, this is a really really big topic now when you're whether you're talking about you know big game populations or or otherwise. Um, you know, bird feed is a uh, is a source of weeds. Um, and then the real thing, the real reason I don't like bird feeders is they're really not that effective. You know, of the 70 species or so that, that have used our yard, fewer than 20% of those um, are actually ones that would come to a feeder. So you're really only getting a small, you know, portion of, of birds by relying on feeders. But we have a lot of feeders, so this will play. Uh, they just look a little less conventional. So this is a... Uh, this is a front yard uh, bird feeder we have. This is our, our thatching ant hill. Um, and uh, it was a warm day there. But the thing with this is, uh, you know, seasonally, it's really important in the, in the, in the winter time, flickers um, will excavate these ant hills to get the larvae when they, when they ants aren't aggressive and, and can't defend them. But it gets used a lot of other different ways. You know, crows will come and uh, on, a, on a hot day or when the ants are really active, they'll sit on top of the ant hill with their wings spread and let the ants crawl all over them. No one's, it's called anting. People aren't totally sure, but another grooming or preening process, or other birds will take these ants and use them, um, you know, to use their formic acid and, the, and then their, and their carcasses to, to, um, to groom themselves. Um, yeah, and this is another bird feeder. It's one of those aspen stems. Um, and uh, you can see where the, the, the woodpecker has excavated the, the larvae. Um, again, you know, it's a different kind of aphid, different species of aphid. Um, it's attracting ants that tend them, but there's also a lot of birds that will eat those aphids as well. You know, like this ruby crown kinglet, for example, it's never going to come to a bird feeder, um, but it will come to these other places. And I mentioned this briefly when I was talking about the hairy woodpecker, but the timing of these in insects um, um, and their like, phenology is really important. It's tied to a lot of other animals as well. So here you can see um, everyone's, you know, I, I think of it as everyone's favorite uh, bird, the black-capped chickadee. It's like the ambassador of the forest or the ambassador from the animal kingdom to people. Um, so their nesting, you know, is coincidental with the availability of food for their young. And what they feed their young are insects, right? Um, and they need an incredible amount of these. You know, just as using the black-capped chickadees as one example of all the other birds out there, they need, you know, access to, uh, you know, a lot. Of, of insects in a timely manner. You know, they don't they don't travel very far, you know, to hunt for these. You know, we have um, inside all of our bird boxes. I have uh, cameras, um, so we can you know periodically we'll stream them on the internet. But I just you know look at them um, myself, and uh, it's a it's a riot. And it's it's really neat to see. It's a lot of fun to see that. But um, but what it really shows you, I'll show you a little video here, is um, you know just oops, just like how much food they need. Um, and if you ever watch you know, both parents feeding just constantly, um, you know, feeding all these little little mouths. 
I always think of like the parent as being such a big hero here, coming back to the to the nest to see, uh, you know, with, with 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 their with their caterpillars. But it's amazing, you know, the the adults will just be gone for a second and return with with caterpillars. Um, so getting into you know some planning ideas and, and designing a native plant garden, it's one of the myths that you'll hear a lot of times is that native plants aren't suitable for a garden, for a home garden, because among other things, um, you know, they take too long to get established. Okay. Um, and that's that could be true. There's certain species, um, you know, like arrowleaf balsam root, you know, that's the you know, the an iconic species of our hillsides and prairies in Montana, right? Um, they're very easy to grow, but they take a long time to flower and they don't transplant well. Um, so if anybody, you know, that's listening now has any interest in growing a balsam root in their yard, go out tonight and plant a seed where you want it to be and then you can't move it there. Um, that's, that's it, that's your spot. Um, so these do take a long time, and just to give you an idea, they take about seven years to flower from, from seed. So it's an investment, right? But they're very easy to grow. Um, you know, we have several different lupin species, and these all take about you know, roughly five years to flower. Um, so it's, again, not hard to grow, but you just have to be patient. There's other plants that people might not think are suitable. Um, this, is a, this is a death camas, you know? It could kill you you know, or your neighbor's kid or something like that. So be careful, you know. There's other things though, like I've always wanted to plant poison ivy, especially along the border um, of my house, just because it, it, it is a truly wonderful plant for pollinators. But, uh, but then those neighbors moved out, you know, kind of, um, I thought I didn't need it as much as I once did. So there are certain, there are certain plants that aren't really that suitable for the home, home garden. And one of them is this guy right here, the bitterroot. You know, everybody loves the bitterroots, our state flower. Yeah, I guess that. Um, we also have a state grass and a grass is a flower, so I don't get that. But um, the bitterroot is beautiful, you know, for that week in June underground. Um, so, you know, and for, you know, if people aren't familiar, bitterroots, um, you know, the, the flowers are huge and they sit right on the ground and they look, you know, so impressive because their leaves have already withered. Um, so all you have are just these blooms on the ground. Well, those blooms open and close with the day and, um, you know, typically that time of the year I go to work early and come home late. So I leave for work and the flowers are closed, come home from work, the flowers are closed. And then once they get pollinated, um, the flowers wither and then it's bare ground until November when the leaves come up out of the ground again. So yeah, bitter roots are great. Um, they're e another one that's super easy to grow. Um, they, they just, they basically thrive on neglect. Um, the worst thing you can do to a bitter root is pay it too much attention, you know, try to water it, give it any kind of nutrients or you know, quality soil. As you can see here, it's basically just growing in gravel in our, in our backyard and likes it that likes it or you don't see them for most of the year. So be patient. Which there are, like I said in the beginning too, there's like, you know, I've got some friends that really just, you know, their goal is just to grow the most difficult plant in the world. Um, but I'm not one of those people. Um, so, but you don't have to be quite patient with, with native plants. So here's um, some old pictures of our, of our garden. This might be, uh, this is in 2000, so 20 years ago. And we thought we were probably done at this point. You know, we have our little compost bin there. Got a ponderosa pine, a little teeny choke cherry, or um, service berry, a choke cherry, some other plants, mountain hollyhock. And I think at this point, you know, we were look at this, all this lawn we removed. You know, we thought we were we were done with we the wild, you know, we're good on the wildlife garden. And then a couple years later, you know, the happy homeowners added some more things and like, okay, that's probably good. Then we added more, we kept reducing the lawn, reducing the lawn, built a greenhouse reducing the lawn some more so there's no more lawn. You know, and, and this this happened, you know, this happened over well less than 20 years. But the, the point is some of this stuff happened just in, in, a, in a few years. And all these plants that you see here are pretty um, quick growing. Even that ponderosa pine, I don't know if you can see it up here very well, um, but that was once our Christmas tree. It's like a three foot Christmas tree and now it's um, it's quite quite large. Um, some other, you know, just to show how you know, quickly some things, you know, can change. Um, 
and I guess with not watering things, our, our garage and house turned yellow rather than blue too. But then you go to the front yard and yeah, we have kind of the same balsam root in the same places. But actually we, were, we started with four, four or five balsam root and we now have, this past year we've had, um, I can't remember, maybe 30 flowering because we have several generations of them. So uh, for a while I kept predicting that uh, our garden would be a wash in, in, in blanket flower, but it took, it's taken some time. So, you know, I, I, I like to stress diversity um, in native plants, and that's what you want. Like, you don't worry about, you know, you know, linking a specific species of animal to a plant, even though they do have those connections, just go for diversity. And I always say, just, you know, plant the most diversity you can, but then inevitably people say, uh-huh, I get it, but what should we plant? So this is what I'm gonna say to plant. And this is, you know, these plants are pretty easy to find, very easy to grow. And, um, and they do well in a wide variety of habitats, going from like full sun to, you know, part shade kind of a thing. So I'll, I'll just read through some of these. I'll show you some pictures. Many of these people know about like white yarrow. Um, oh, the other thing is I, I, the, all the ones I'm gonna talk about here are also, you know, deer tolerant. So meaning, um, deer don't particularly like them. They might investigate them, they might, you know, chew on them, but they're, they're, they're not the preferred food. So white yarrow, so we have a native yarrow, which is the white yarrow, but there's also, um, you know, the, all the cultivar varieties of yarrow, you know, so you can get yarrow that comes in any color, you know, and blooms at any time. But our white yarrow is, um, I, I think the prettiest of them is because the leaves have, real, and leaves and stems have really gray cast and they're really feathery. Um, and they're different than like the lawn weed variety yarrow, but it has a bad reputation because of the, the lawn weed and other ones, but it's very easy to grow, deer don't like it, um, and it provides really neat structure, especially in the winter. Horse mint, this goes by a lot of different names. Um, bee balm is probably the most common one. Um, and again, we have a native one, but there's also, you know, um, cultivated varieties. And the problem with the cultivated varieties are the bloom times are going to be different, the colors are going to be different, the size of the flowers is, is different than what's native. And again, it's the, the insects that rely on them that's so important. The other interesting thing with the, the native horse mint is it gets a white powdery mildew. And uh, it's totally fine, but that's also one way you can kind of tell them apart from like some of the cultivar varieties. Hairy false golden aster, the lower plants, um, really drought tolerant. Blanket flower, I think most people are familiar with that one. It's large, you know, kind of daisy looking flower. Um, Wilcox's penstemon, we have a lot of different types of penstemon. This is one of the more common, easier to grow ones. Showy fleabane, um, and that's that purple daisy looking flower that's been in a lot of the pictures here. It grows in everywhere from full sun to, to part shade um, and spreads really well, which I like, other people, you know, um, might not like that as much. And goldenrod, and goldenrod is another one that has a kind of a bad reputation. We have several different species in Montana. Um, that gets a bad reputation from people um, in the Midwest or the East because goldenrod flower at the same, they've got very showy blooms and they flower at the same time as ragweed which is much less conspicuous. And ragweed is a big allergen to folks. People are really allergic to it. But the pollen of goldenrod is such that people don't, are not allergic to it, but it's just got a really bad reputation. Um, yeah, here's um, white yarrow and uh, blanket flower. And like I said, the nice thing about yarrow, one, it's easy to grow and uh, does great in a lot of situations. And it just provides a nice structure um, and even a nice landing pad for, for, for butterflies. Here's a horse mint um, or bee balm and blanket flower again. Um, and showy fleabane in the background here and um, also gold. This is a Missouri goldenrod, um, which is made of Montana. So it's Canada goldenrod. They're really similar, but Canada goldenrod's a lot shorter. Here, here's Harry false golden aster, and this is really more of a ground cover. Um, you know, blanket flower, uh, showy fleabane. Some grasses, you know, 
that's the other thing that often gets lost in a lot of this is, you know, we, you know, the for a lot of the forests, especially the more open ponderosa pine forests, as well as, you know, the prairies are grass dominated. Um, but in, in most, you know, landscapes that, you know, that what well, gets dominated by a different kind of grass, but um, blue bunch wheatgrass, um, very easy to grow, uh, it's our state grass. Um, Deer don't eat it. Elk do. So if you have a you know an elk issue in your neighborhood, you maybe avoid that one. Uh, prairie June grass, um, Idaho fescue. Those are two smaller bunch grasses um, that are both very easy to grow. Um, and rough fescue, which um, you know forms those big hummocks. And I think it was robbed. That should be our state grass because it's uh, you know I, I don't I don't know what happened with the voting back then, but. Um, um, I was very disappointed um, that, that rough fescue is not our state grass because it, it's, its range is more limited to Montana. Blue bunch goes everywhere, but rough fescue. Uh, well, and I try to get this back on the, the agenda for uh, another election here. Um, rough fescue is really beautiful grass. Um, and, you know, one thing we have a lot of in Montana are shrubby shrubs and shrubby trees. We don't have that many tree species, especially that are suitable for, you know, uh, for landscapes. Um, but some of the shrubby shrubs um, that, are good, you know, that, are, that are really versatile um, are you know, rubber, rubber rabbit brush, which is, um, you know, you typically find in, in prairies or, or even some ponderosa pine openings. Um, that was once really common in the Missoula Valley, more so than like uh, Big Basin Sage. Um, and rubber rabbit brush is really neat because it's one of the last things to flower um, into September and even in October. Um, we actually, there's rubber rabbit brush in our front yard that never quite flowered this year because of that, uh, that cold weather we had. Um, but they're really, really late flowering. And you get um, some really neat insects that are attracted to that because there's not a lot of flowering at that time. Um, woods rose is really versatile. It, in western Montana, it goes from the prairies all the way into seasonally inundated areas or up in, into the forests. We have several different species of rose. We have a couple different species of rabbit brush. Um, golden currant um, is another versatile one. Um, it gets a yellow tubular flower. And that's one of the first things to flower in um, you know, in Western Montana here. Wax current is actually flowers just a little bit earlier. So because of that, it's a preferred food for um, hummingbirds. And it's one of the best ways to attract hummingbirds to your yard because it, it, its flowering is coincidental with their arrival. Um, even though it's a yellow flower, um, if, you know, if, if, if you, it, you know, when, when hummingbirds return to this part of the country, there's nothing red that flowers and nothing red that's going to flower until July or so, but they come back, you know, March and April. Um, mock orange um, and three lobe sumac are some other you know, just wonderful and diverse um, shrubs. Here's a woods rose. Um, here's that golden currant flower I was talking about. Um, since it's the first to flower, it's one of, also one of the first to fruit. And it's really sought after by a variety of, um, of, of other bird species. Um, the currants, hawthorn, those will get you know flowers or um, fruits really early. You know they'll they'll come back to an individual like hawthorn tree or um, um, or golden currant bush. Birds will, will keep returning to to check on the ripeness of the berries. Um, it's pretty neat. So some shrubby trees, and when I say, what I mean by shrubby trees, these are like multi-stem trees, but you know, in a garden environment, you can prune them however you like. Um, service berry, choke cherry, um, I think most people are, are familiar with those, but mountain ash, so that's one that um, has gotten, um, it's uh, gorgeous, I think it's much more attractive than the more common European ash that people use in landscapes. And the other thing with European ash is it's 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 become invasive and it's you know it's spread beyond you know the neighborhoods and um, and streets where it was planted. Um, but our mountain ash is multi stems um, and is really gorgeous. Um, elderberry, we have a couple of species of elderberry, but the blue elderberry 
Um, it's probably the easier one to find and to grow. And then also Hawthorne, which is like a misspelled here as well. So how, where to get, get native plants? So the best thing to do is join the Montana Native Plant Society and learn from, from those resources and the experts there. And here's their, um, here's their URL. But local nurseries, um, I think that's one of the best places to get native plants, if for no other reason than to um, let people know that you're interested in them, to ask you know, your local nursery where their native plants are. And if they say they don't have them, you know, say that you would like them, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, salvages, unfortunately, um, you know, a lot of our, you know, we're losing a lot of native plants because of habitat loss, and that comes from development. And, uh, um, my wife, Marilyn, used to coordinate salvages um, during subdivisions um, or subdivision expansions in the Missoula area you know, 10 or 15 years ago when that was really common. And unfortunately, now Missoula is growing inward rather than outward. But um, you know, yeah, we, and um, if you know of a subdivision going in, you can you know, oftentimes co you know, contact the contractor or developer and remove the plants before they um, go under plow. Seed, there's, um, you know, or almost all the plants that I, that I mentioned tonight are easily grown from seed. Um, so collecting seeds um, is, uh, you know, from the wild is, 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 you know, you can do or from your, you know, from somebody else's yard that has, you know, these plants, um, it's a great way to go. What I do recommend, though, with seeds, though, is not to just you know broadcast the seeds into your yard and you know hopefully just stand back and watch the you know prairie explode it's because it's really hard to identify um young plants um oftentimes impossible until they get they get larger um and a lot of them don't have um tremendous success so what, what i recommend is growing even if, even if you want to collect seeds grow them in pots and containers and um and then plant them once they're um once they're larger and you're sure you know what it is um transplant them but not from the wild but from other places and this is where you know um you know all of, or for the for a long time now uh, we've just been moving plants around in our yard and every year we have a, a plant sale um from plants from our yard uh, to go to go other places um, um, from friends or neighbors or things like that. But yeah, don't take plants from the wild. A lot of times it's legal to do so, but it's really not um, not the right thing to do. Um, some references or books. Um, there's a few here that I, that I really like. Probably you know, the, the top few here. Um, and if anybody's interested in growing plants from seed, um, Sheila Morrison, um, uh, a Missoula, um, native, Missoula, Montana Native Plant Society uh, legend, uh, wrote this book on growing over, you know, I think it's over 300 species from seed. It's called the Montana or the Magic of Montana Native Plants. You can you can Google it or, or, or go to the Native Plant Society website to find it. Um, but that's really um, that is the Bible on how to grow stuff. Um, here and she is one of those people that will, you know, will grow anything from any condition you know, possible. So, um, and like I mentioned, um, you know, I, I don't update my blog anymore, but it's there as a resource. So you're welcome to visit our garden at any time on that blog and find answers to um, you know, a lot of common common questions, um, including probably every topic I talked about tonight. Um, so, um, with that, I would be happy to uh, take questions. I haven't looked at the, the chat, um, but if, if folks have questions, I'd be happy to, to answer. I have a question, which is um, if you want have um, sort of a grassy meadow, is there a way to um, encourage diversity there that you recommend without having to transplant in um, 
seedlings of some mm. sort, or do you think that that uh, putting in uh, seedlings would be the best way to go of, uh, you know, flowering plants or um, uh, little shrubs and things like that? That's a, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's hard to answer without seeing it, unfortunately. But but you 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 bring up some good points. There are ways to promote diversity, you know, um, and uh, or encourage, you know, one species over another. If you're trying to deter one species, you know, maybe you don't let it flower or, you know, you're, you know, so you cut it back. Or if it's, you know, from competition for space, you know, you cut it back to allow other, other species to thrive. Um, so there are ways in, in that regard. It's hard to know, like, without knowing what grass is there, um, you know, um, or what plants you're trying to encourage. But um, there's there's a lot you can do with um, with just simply, you know, kind of um, pruning. Um, yeah, and that's that's what we, we talk about a lot. Since we don't have like these big herbivores in our in our garden, like my, my wife and I are the, the deer and elk and, or, or bison. You know, we have to go through in the in the fall and kind of prune stuff stuff back. But that's simply doing the job of others, you know, of other animals. And uh, um, and you know, we do it, you know, for aesthetics, but also to promote diversity. And you can really shift things just by cutting things back at certain times and allowing things to seed and not allowing some other things to seed. But if it's, an, a, a, depending on the, the type of grass, if it's like a pasture grass or a rhizomatous grass, it could be really um, challenging to get anything else established beyond, you know, physically removing that or physically, you know, putting in more competitive plants. Uh, by competitive, I just mean like larger, um, like container stock or something like that. Um, so I don't, yeah, I probably didn't answer your question, but well, that's, there are, I mean, that's, ways, yeah, the one of the, the probably the most challenging thing are like the rhizomatous grasses, getting other things established in there. Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you must have lots of native bees. You you showed a picture of leaf cutter. Yep. Uh, do you have native bee hotel? Yeah, you know. So um, I, you know, like I mentioned, that most of our native bees nest in the ground, right? Um, but there are a lot of species. I mean, it's like seventy percent or, or more. But there, but that still leaves a lot of different species of native bees that are solitary nester that nest in cavities. You know, what, you know the best. And um, the best places for those are like those, you know, aspen snags I showed you. That's what, you know, those little cavities from whether they're woodpeckers or whether they're from boars or anything like that. Um, that's great habitat. But you're exactly right. Yeah, uh, bee boxes or bee houses are another way you can provide, um, you know, nesting sites. They're not really, I um, mean, it, it's, uh, I, so the answer is yes, I have a lot of them you know, um, in, in my garden, and it's more of just, uh, it's a fun way to, to see them, you know. All of the holes we have in every tree or every board in our yard have cavity nesters, or, or, or I'm sorry, yeah, solitary nesting bees in them. Um, but those, uh, but bee boxes, if, I hope everyone knows what I'm talking about, it's a nice way to put them in a viewable area so you can watch them, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of those. Um, and you know, to be really effective, one thing to do is, is use a variety of different sizes. The most common size for a hole, I think off the, so there, there's a, um, if, you, if you go on my blog, you can search for like how to build a bee box, um, or build a bee box in five minutes or something like that. And that has a step-by-step -step instruction that it really is that simple. I mean, all you need to do is just drill some holes in a thick board and you've made a bee box. That's, that's all it is. But the size of the hole is going to um, um, make it more suitable for one species or another. And like I said, we have a huge diversity of species. So you can, you know, have like one sixteenth inch holes up to, you know, like half inch holes for, for you know, some really big bees. Typically like around five sixteenths is like, is like a nice medium. 
But if you were to drill, you know, have a lot of a lot of diversity in a box, I bet you would uh, you would see a lot more diversity of the of, of the bee species that use it. Yeah, people call them like mason bees um, as just describing you know general um, um, solitary nesting um, cavity nesting bee. One other use that I've we have for lawn is uh, as a fire uh, barrier. What uh, are there native plants that you recommend uh, that would be uh, alternatives? Gravel, yeah. <laughs> 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 Rocks, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it, it, it's a really good point. And again, that goes back to, um, um, you know, what the goal is. I, and I'm like, I'm, and, and you know, lawn can be very effective um, at stopping, you know, fire, not because of the lawn so much, but just the fact that it's irrigated, you know, in a moist place. Um, yeah, I mean, again, that, that's, you know, a specific use and, uh, but going back to my, to my thing, that maybe you don't need as big of an area for that, or, you know, um, and, or maybe you could transition to it um, more with some, you know, some maybe more water, you know, like um, put in smooth blue aster or, or Rocky Mountain iris or, or things like that, that you can water a lot and are gonna bloom and you know, kind of stay green um, or tree vein, flea vein or things like that at the periphery, you know, and then kind of go to the lawn and have that, you know, barrier by your house. But even, you know, thinking about ways to reduce it or transform it into something that still might be irrigated and safe. Um, is important. I missed uh, seeing Rocky Mountain bee plant in your in your plant community. Oh, Colomia? Yeah. Yes. Um, we have it in our yard, I, but I didn't, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of species. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of it. I, I, I just associate it with, uh, with disturbed areas and like uh, roadside ditches. I know people love it and I've got no problem with the plant. It's a wonderful plant. My friends love it and all that stuff, but uh, I'm not, a, not, not uh, but we do have some in our yard. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Because yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Oh, it's a great <laughs> plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is it is a good one. It does take a lot of space though. And we have a you know we have a pretty small, small yard. Why do the bees love it? Mm -hmm. Peter. Kind of looks like we're um winding down here. Does Kit, do you want to send everybody off? Are there any more questions? I have a question. Can I, yes. can I ask a question? No. I, I, I'm not doing well with the chat, so I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I typed in a question. It has to do with lupin that I got in a nursery and planted, and that's been many, many years ago, and it's spreading like crazy. Uh, I like it. It's beautiful, but it's... Um, it's really taking over and I'm wondering if I could or should transplant some of it. Am I asking for trouble <laughs> if I do that? Well, um, trouble, I, I mean, it's, um, I mean, it's your, it's your garden and if you want it to be more contained, then certainly dig it up. Um, but I, maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, it's, uh, if, if you, or if you like the way it's spreading in your yard, then that's that's fine too. Is it as good for for the insects and birds? Um, yeah, I don't I don't know what um, what variety or what species it is, but um, basic purple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's probably yeah. So we have um, we have several different you know native lupin species, um, and um, I, I imagine if you got it in a nursery, it's probably. Um, not a native one, but it, it's it's um, it's probably not going to be harmful to insects or anything. I mean, you're not doing harm per se, um, but it, it might not be as beneficial as a native. But if you like it in your yard, then keep it. Yeah, 
And if you like how it's spreading, that's, that's great. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're beautiful flowers. Yeah. And I've been trying to transplant the blue camas. Um, and uh, I'm not sure, it, it, maybe uh, it, transplanting isn't the best, but uh, my neighbor has like a field of it. And oh. I just move a few over and um, it seems like they don't establish especially well. Yeah, I've, I've never tried. Um, I would think that it would be fairly easy to do just because of you know, by nature of being a bulb, except if they um, you know, just don't, I mean, I, I think of them as, you know, have, you know, they need to have like the right amount of water at the right time, you know, that seasonal, you know, those seasonal wet meadows. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I would think that it, you know, if you're, if you just don't have the conditions, it could be a struggle. Um, and if you had the condition, you might have them already. If you're that okay. close. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like it would be easy to transplant, but they might just need a little bit more water at the right time. Are there any more questions? If not, um, uh, I'd like to really thank uh, David Schmetterling for a, a great and uh, interesting talk. And uh, we learned a lot and a lot of good resources there. And uh, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Thank no, thank you for having me. All right. Thank you so much, David. And um, we will be uh, posting the recording of this. Oh, okay. Uh, on our website. So if you want to see it again, or friends, viewers might want to see it, uh, we hope to have it up in the next week or so. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks so Good night.